This conference will now be recorded. Okay, good morning, brothers and sisters. This is Minister Jerry Spencer from Bank Street Memorial Baptist Church in Norfolk, Virginia. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I want to thank everyone for listening in today. I pray that you've had a good week. I pray that the blessings of the Lord has been upon you. And so with that, I want to start off by um, opening up with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into uh, our study for today. Um, our study uh, is the second part of uh, Isaiah, the book of Isaiah that comes from Isaiah chapter 48, verses 3 through 8a and verses 17 and 18. But before we get started, brothers and sisters, let us, uh, let us have a word of prayer. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for blessing us to see another day, for waking us up this morning, for starting us on our way. We ask and pray now, Father, that your blessings might be upon all those who are listening today, and that the Holy Spirit would open the eyes and the minds and the ears of those who are listening today, that the word of truth might be spoken from these lips of clay. I pray, O oh, Heavenly Father, that the Holy Spirit would now take full control of this Bible study ministry. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name, amen. All right, brothers and sisters, we're gonna go ahead and get started. And again, uh, we are reading from, our study comes from Isaiah chapter 48, verses uh, uh, three through eight A and verses 17 and 18. And so our key verse comes from Isaiah chapter 48, verse 17. This is what the Lord says, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. I am the Lord, your God, who teaches you what is best for you, who directs you in the way you should go. Powerful words, brothers and sisters. And we need to hang on to those words because the Lord does know what's best for us. Our title for today comes from God's promises to restore and you can listen to the, uh, the biblical study links live um, by going to the link on your screen. And as we continue on, uh, our next biblical study will come from John chapter 17, verses 14 through 24. Our next study will be coming from John chapter 17, verses 14 through 24. Uh, God's willing, we will have that study next week. So, as we continue, I want to make sure my screen is working. Okay, uh, again, there are previous YouTube studies. Uh, again, you can click on the word here and you can get that the first one you can get to our the lesson last week. And the last link is the one that you can see all the studies. All right, our historical background I'm going to back up here just for a moment and make sure I'm on the right screen here. Uh, my computer wants to um, uh, act up this morning, so we're going to just bring everything back and get to the historical background. So give me just a moment, brothers and sisters. And as the screen is trying to do its thing, this thing, we continue our study from darkness to light, God's promises. And this week's focus is titled, God Promises to Guide. God Promises to Guide. And so we find brothers and sisters that while the prophet Isaiah, let me bring this up again, please. Hold on, to make sure I've got everything here. Um, okay, well, we find that um, while the prophet Isaiah focused on chapters 40 through 47 uh, was primarily toward the Jewish exiles in Babylon, uh, who, um, though, though wavering, had not forsaken their God. They finally understood and listened to the Lord, their God. I want to take a minute, brothers and sisters, to continue to try to get my screen to act right for me. So just give me, just bear with me just for a moment and uh, I'll see if I can get this corrected. 
Okay, let's see here. Okay, I think I'm going in the opposite direction here, so just bear with me just for a moment. Okay, there we are. Okay, so I'm going to enlarge this so we can all see it. And so in chapter 48, it addresses, it addresses the whole nation of Israel and recalls the sins which had brought it to its uh, political disaster, namely the, con the combination of insincere worship and idolatry, also known as syncretism which is the attempt to combine the worship of the one true God with the worship of idols. This is called syncretism. But we know, friends, that the scriptures are clear. The Lord has said, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, nor my praise to a carved image. And so what we find in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, that's where you get that scripture from. We understand from last week's study that Judah went into captivity and that the Babylonians were, were, will take full control of the southern kingdom called Judah. Um, this happened in 586 BC. Now, the first temple that was built by Solomon had been destroyed. All the vessels were taken and Jerusalem was destroyed and the people were deported to Babylon. And so we find that, let's see here, my computer's really not cooperating with me this morning. And I really do apologize for that. And so one would thought that seeing the Northern Kingdom of Israel capture and the deportation into Assyria 136 years earlier, that Judah would have learned not to do that which caused Israel to go into captivity, which was committing idolatry and syncretism. But in fact, brothers and sisters, Judah did worse. And it was only because of God's name, his grace, and promised to David that Judah was spared complete destruction. Isaiah had rightly spoken, brothers and sisters, that during those terrible days, though Israel and Judah were punished, it did no good. Saying in Isaiah chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, why should you be stricken again? You will revolt more and more, the scripture says. The whole head is sick and the whole heart faints. From the sole of the foot even to the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed or bound up or soothed with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Strangers devour your land in your presence and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And so what Isaiah is saying is that no matter what God had done, the people still rebelled. The people were still disobedient. And so to be clear, brothers and sisters, Isaiah makes three very interesting observations worth remembering. First, he points out the absurdity absurdity of worshiping idols. And he gave us this example in Isaiah chapter 41, verses 22 through 24. The idolater takes a piece of wood, uses part of it to make a fire and bake bread. This is the example that he's giving. And while the rest of the wood, and with the rest of the wood, he makes himself a god, an eye of idol to worship. We find this in Isaiah chapter 44, verses 14 through 17. Secondly, and closely related to that, is that Isaiah emphasizes that there is only one God. 
There is no other God but the Lord. Isaiah chapter 44, verses 6, uh, verse 6, and chapter 45, verse 6. It's keeping in mind, however, that scripture is clear regarding, regarding the Holy Trinity. Thirdly, Isaiah frequently notes the Lord's knowledge and control of the future. In other words, friends, God knows the end from the beginning and will do all that he pleases. Lastly, the one we call God is the creator of all that exists. The Lord God laid the foundation of the earth and stretched out the heavens. Isaiah chapter 48, verses 13 and chapter 51, verse 13. And in his creative activity, brothers and sisters, the Lord God also created the nation of Israel to be his chosen nation. And so what we take away from this chapter, chapter 48, is Israel being refined for God's glory and God's ancient plan put in place long ago to redeem Israel. That plan was put in place long ago to redeem Israel. In Isaiah chapter 48, verses 1 and 2, if you listen carefully, you will discover various ways the people of God identify themselves as God's people. But what you will also find is that Israel and Judah's assertion of being God's people, but not in truth or righteousness. So they claim to be God's people, yet their actions showed something different. That's what this is saying. And that God's faithfulness stood in stark contrast to the people's hypocrisy, because that's what was going on at this time. Hear this, O house of Jacob, who are called by the name of Israel and have come forth from the wellspring of Judah, wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord and make mention of the God of Israel. But he goes on to say, but not in truth or in righteousness. For they call themselves after the holy city and they lean on the God of Israel. The Lord of hosts is his name. And so what we see, brothers and sisters, is that the name Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, we know this from the scripture, who also represented the northern kingdom. But since the northern kingdom has been destroyed, the name has now been attached to Judah, which will include Israel in time as the entire people of God. And though all have come forth from the wellsprings of Judah, who swear by the name of the Lord, it says, he says, and make mention of the God of Israel, but not in truth or in righteousness. And so our Lord makes mention of this in Mark chapter 7, verses 6 and 7. In his reply to the Pharisees wanting to know why Jesus' disciples were eating without washing their hands. And so listen to the words of the Savior. He answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors, honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrine the commandments of men. So Jesus was actually quoting Isaiah chapter 9, 29, verse 13. And so we see the souls of men standing before the judgment seat of God. Many will be found guilty of just giving God lip service. But their hearts were far from believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and obeying his words. To those today who profess Jesus as their Savior, who says they love the Lord, are they demonstrating obedience and love? The proof of your love, the proof of my love, is found in John chapter 14, verse 15, where Jesus says this, if you love me, keep my commandments, or rather, you will keep my commandments or my words. And so the Lord does not pose the question of being in love 
but rather if you love me. In other words, brothers and sisters, being in love has emotion tied to it. It has, it's a noun, if you will. But Jesus is saying, if you love me, in other words, that word love is not talking about feeling. He is talking about actions. He is talking about doing. It is a verb. It is doing what the Lord commands us to do. So the Lord says, if you love me, keep my commandment. That's action. That's action. The word love, again, is a verb and means to act or to do. Israel had failed. Judah had failed. But in God's love, promise, and mercy, he saved a remnant. And so today, brothers and sisters, the nations have failed. But in God's love and mercy, he sent us a savior in order to redeem a remnant from among the Gentiles, from among us, that will someday become a part of God's chosen people, even God's remnant. And so are you among the remnants? The full message provides the details of this study, brothers and sisters. And so let's take a moment and let's go and see what our study has to say. In Isaiah chapter 48, verses 3 through 6a, the Lord says, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They went forth from my mouth, and I caused them to hear it. Suddenly I did them, and they came to pass, because I know that you were obstinate, and your neck was as iron sinew, and your brow bronze. Even from the beginning, I have declared it to you. Before it came to pass, I proclaimed it to you, lest you should say, my idol has done this, and my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. You have heard. See all this, and will you not declare it? And so, Chapter 47 of Isaiah ends by showing the cruelty that Babylon had inflicted on Judah. And while touting its arrogance and its devotion to astrology and magical pro uh, practices, idols, and, uh, and et cetera, what Babylon didn't un understand, brothers and sisters, they did not understand that God was in control of history and God's control was also over the affairs of men. In other words, the Babylonian captivity of Judah had been ordained as divine punishment for Judah of Judah. And to that extent, Babylon was to be no more than God's agent, you see, in this divine discipline. But the cruelty and the merciless treatment shown to the exiles compel God to exact divine retribution against Babylon itself. Therefore, chapter 47 ends on a note of the uselessness of Babylonian worship, meaning that there is no one who can save you, Babylon. There is no one who can save you, not even the gods and idols that you worship. This is what God is saying. And there is none who can prevent the salvation, redemption, and the return of the exiles, the remnant of Judah, to their land. Nothing is going to prevent that because this was God's divine will, divine plan. And so Isaiah writes the words of the Lord who said this, I have declared the former things from the beginning. They, the former things, went forth from my mouth and I caused them to hear it. The Lord goes on to say this, brothers and sisters, suddenly I did them and they came to pass. This confirms, brothers and sisters, this confirms that the Lord's absolute authority and omniscience is in play here, that he knows all that there is to know even before it comes to pass. 
because he is the genesis of all knowledge, the creator of all known things in existence and all there is to know about all things in existence before they existed and how they will end. This is what the God, this is what our God knows. And so the Lord, therefore, it says, the Lord sent his prophets to tell his people of the things which will come to pass even before they became a nation. The Lord knew the stubbornness of Israel and Judah. He knew that they were obstinate. Their necks were, uh, was, uh, he says here, their neck was an iron sinew and their brow bronze which are metaphors for being stubborn and stiff neck. Even as early as the wilderness journey, brothers and sisters, going from Egypt to Canaan, the people had a rebellious heart. In, in Exodus chapter 32, verses one through four, word, verses one and four rather, it writes, now when the people saw that Moses delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aaron and said to him, come, make us gods that shall be, that, sh that shall go before us. As for, as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. You see? And after Aaron received the gold from their hand, and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf. Then they said, this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Now, can you see how, how obnoxious that is? It makes no sense for someone to carve or make a molded image and then make it their God. But that's what they did. And so it goes on to say that he says that this is your God, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses wrote in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 27. He said this before his death, brothers and sisters. He said this. He said, he says that, for I know your rebellion and your stiff neck. If today while I am yet alive with you, you have been rebellious against the Lord, then how much more after my death? Moses was right, friends. How unfortunate it was that Israel's stubbornness was a common thread in the nation's history throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament. We find it in Judges chapter 2, verse 19. We find it in Matthew chapter 23, verse 37. We find it in Acts chapter 7, verse 51. For Israel and Judah, from long ago, even from the beginning, the Lord had declared and proclaimed the things that were to come to pass before it came to pass. Otherwise, the law says, the people should say, my idol has done them and my carved image and my molded image have commanded them. And so to be clear, brothers and sisters, long before Judah's exile, even when they were prospering during the time of Isaiah, the prophets of God foretold of things to come. So when it did come to pass, the people could not point to their carved image to say that they made it happen. In fact, in fact, the Lord God had again challenged the people to admit that he had told them what was to come and they still refused to admit that God had done these things. And so the Lord says to Judah, to his remnant, you have heard, see all this, and will you not declare it, says the Lord? So even today, brothers and sisters, even today, prophecies spoken of in the Old Testament and the New Testament 
are yet to come to pass, but it will because everything else that has been prophesied has come to pass. And so listen to what the Lord says to Judah. Listen to what the Lord says to Judah in verses 6b through 8a. From now on, I will tell you of new things, of hidden things unknown to you. They are created now and not long ago, he says. You have not heard of them before today. So you cannot say, yes, I knew of them. And so the Lord has said, even now I will speak of hidden things that are unknown to my people. Though historical events long predicted by the prophets were even now being shaped and were coming to pass, the Lord speaks of new things and hidden things which were completely without prophetic warning or any other means of anticipation. In other words, brothers and sisters, no amount of foretelling was going to allow the people to know what God was doing or what God was going to do next. The new things were novel in that they, were be, they will be created now, he says. So to be clear, to be clear, friends, only the Lord God can create something that has never existed before. The fact that the Lord God created the physical universe, living things, to include man and woman, even the nation of Israel, among other nations and peoples, is not so much the revealing of things hidden, but the display, the display of God's infinite creative power, presence, and knowledge at all times according to his good pleasure. Therefore, knowledge of such things can only come at the time they are revealed and put into effect by our creator so that no one can claim, yes, I knew of them. No one will be able to make that claim. And so listen carefully, brothers and sisters. The act of truly hearing the Lord, the act of truly hearing the Lord has always been demonstrated by the act of obedience to what the Lord has spoken which for the believer, for us, involves trust, belief, and faith. For true Christians today, it points to one key verse, one key verse, John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. The love Jesus speaks of, again, brothers and sisters, is a verb and means to act upon, to do, to show your obedience, to demonstrate your love by doing and keeping God's word. It does not mean to fall in love. It means to act. It means to be demonstrated by doing what the Lord commands us to do. Believing that his words and his promises are true. Trusting that his promises will be revealed in time and having the faith to withstand the storms of life because you believe on the Lord. And so we find as far back as Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 25 through 28, on the mountain of Sinai, at Sinai, that the children of Israel, Israel were afraid of the voice of the Lord and said to Moses, they said this, you go near and hear all the word, and hear all that the Lord our God may say, and tell us all that the Lord our God says to you, and we will hear and do it. If only Israel had kept their word, if only Israel had kept their word, the Lord says to Moses, oh, that they, meaning Israel, has such a heart in them that they would fear me, that means to reverence, to give reverence, and always keep my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29. And so in the second part of our lesson, our study for this morning, it goes on to say, 
in verse 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. I love that. Isaiah once again reminds Judah that the Lord has not forgotten them. Though they suffer at the hands of the Babylonians, they are not forgotten, friends. And here is their assurance as Isaiah reiterates, in a sense, God's title and who God is. He is their redeemer. He redeems them from death, from the Egyptian slavery, and from the Babylonian captivity. It reflects the closeness God had with Israel. He is the Holy One of Israel, which reflects the distinctiveness of God's relationship with his people. Isaiah says that the Lord teaches. The Lord teaches. Now, in the Old Testament, we don't find, we don't often read what the Lord teaches. But in the New Testament, ah, in the New Testament, God, in the person of Jesus, is not only called rabbi, which means teacher, but he confirms this in John chapter 13, verse 13, saying to his disciples, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say well, for so I am, you see. Not only are we, uh, are we uh, assured that Jesus is God, which we find in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. But Matthew chapter 23, verse 8, confirms him as the only true teacher and master who teaches his people Israel and all who believes on him to profit and to excel in life. But it comes with the first lesson of his teaching, which is obeying the Lord's words. Obeying the Lord's commandments. The Lord knows what's best for us, brothers and sisters. The Lord knows what's best for us. And so we need to be humble enough to believe this. And in believing, we need to learn to walk in his will and endure whatever it is that we have to endure. If we are walking in his will, and if we know that the Lord has, has our best interest in mind, no matter what we are going through, we need to stand fast in the Lord. We need to just keep moving forward because God knows what's best for us. We need to be humble enough to believe this and let the Lord, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, direct and guide us in this life. And so listen carefully, brothers and sisters. Not only does God teach us what is best, but the Lord directs us also in the way we should go. If we let him, if we let him. The best example is that of Jesus, who teaches like that of a good shepherd leading his flock. He leads us in the path of righteousness and to the Father and further reveals who he is, saying in John chapter 14, verse 6, that if you had known me, you would have known my father. Also, he says, and from now on, you know him and have seen him. So what Jesus is saying is that whoever sees him sees the father. Jesus is saying that he is God the second person of the divine trinity, that Christ is what? He is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation, according to Colossians chapter 1, verse 15. All these things God in the person of Christ did for Jews and Gentiles alike. And finally, brothers and sisters, he says, oh, in verse 18, oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. 
Verse 18 sounds very familiar, friends. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 29 says the same. Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear and always keep and, and always keep all my commandments, that it may be well with them and with their children forever. Oh, what Israel and Judah would have been had they only obeyed the Lord. Nations, nations will look to them for righteous living as they would have, have, have been a nation of priests, according to Deuteronomy chapter 19, which writes, and if you do, he will set you high above all the nations he has made. Then you will receive praise, honor, and renown. You will be a nation that is holy to the Lord your God, just as he promised. Your descendants also would have been like the sand and the offspring of your body like the grain of sand. His name would not have been cut off nor destroyed before me. Though being held in captivity, brothers and sisters, for 70 years, Judah, Judah has the promises of God. They will eventually go forth from Babylon. They will flee from the Chaldeans with a voice of singing, declaring and proclaiming this brothers and sisters, utter it to the ends of the earth that says this, the Lord has redeemed his servant, Jacob. So in other words, we end our study today by saying that God's promises are sure. Israel went into captivity. Israel suffered because of disobedience. But the nations suffered because of the way they treated God's people, the ruthlessness in which they uh, uh, treated God's people. And so God is saying in Isaiah chapter 48, that though you have been in captivity, I will bring you out of captivity and I will make you a nation again. The remnant will become a nation. And that remnant is the nation that we know of today that's called Israel. Let us pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word because we know that your word is truth. We thank you, Holy Spirit, because we know that, Lord, you only speak the truth and you only reveal the truth of God's word. We ask and pray, Father, now that the truth may continue to dwell within us and that, Lord, we might show our love for you by doing those things that pleases you doing that which is right in your sight. I pray this, Father, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. That ends our study for today, brothers and sisters. Uh, again, apologize for the glitches of the computer. Um, and uh, we will continue, I will continue, rather, to keep working on it until I can get all the glitches out. And so until next week's God's will, uh, we will see you then. Amen. Have a blessed day.